seats, also indicating that he will talk to us once there's clarity on the telecom auctions. But moving on, after missing the divestment target for six consecutive years, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley has lowered the divestment target for FY17 to 36,000 crore rupees. Now, he expects to garner 20,500 crore rupees through strategic stake sale in FY17. And for this very purpose, the government has assigned Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Arvind Panakriya with the task of identifying assets that are fit for divestment. CNBC TV team Shireen Bhan caught up with him as well a short while ago. Here's a slice of that conversation. We've been tasked now to look at what we can do as far as the strategic stake sale policy is concerned. The finance minister is saying that the Niti Aayog will decide which candidates the Niti Aayog will decide what CPSCs should monetize and so on and so forth. When can we expect the blueprint for strategic sales, sir? So, now, uh, you know, we have been assigned the task, but that what we have been assigned is the first step towards the strategic sale. So we identify the uh, uh, PSUs, the, uh, the specific units that ought to be prioritized, and we suggest how much to disinvest. Uh, the rest of it then goes to the uh, ministry's concerns, etc. So we plan to move pretty rapidly. Actually, I have started talking to some of the people who understand this area better. Uh, Within government or outside of government, sir? Uh, well, I mean, I'm trying to pick the brains of those who know this field well, uh, also outside the government. Uh, I just want to know, you know, uh, because there was a disinvestment commission before. That's right. Uh, and uh, so there was, there's some knowledge as to, you know, how exactly we should uh, uh, identify the specific units, how much to disinvest uh, uh, and so forth. So we are already on the job. So we are talking about privatization and the Minister of State for Finance also clarifying that it's not just going to be limited to loss-making PSUs, it will include profit-making public sector companies as well. Uh, that we have to wait and see. We have to do the full assessment of uh, uh, what are the good candidates uh, and, and uh, uh, certainly in certain areas that are regarded as strategic uh, uh, for the government, uh, this investment will not take place. Which I would imagine are things like defense, etc. But outside of that, is everything on the table? What would be the driving parameters, sir? <laughs> Let me not jump the gun. Let's sir, what, what, what would be the driving parameters as far as the strategic stake sale policy are concerned? No, no. I mean, all that requires identification, thinking, uh, discussions. So let me not take a position on that just yet. Okay, let me ask you this, uh, uh, you know, we've had uh, the government, uh, you know, get out of companies like Balco and AZL in the past, but still not being able to give up the residual stake that the government holds, even though there is a willing buyer, uh, there are all kinds of issues, of course, uh, litigation, and then uh, you don't know whether the MMDR Act requires to be amended or so on and so forth. What are the obstacles that you envisage on account of this? No, no, the, 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 I mean, now when we get to this job, we are going to look at all the parameters, uh, all the possibilities, uh, uh, including the one that you have just pointed out, uh, shares in the PSUs that have actually been privatized now. Uh, but we'll take a call at that stage. Now, there are also legal barriers, as you are pointing out. Those also we have to identify. So, but our job really is to at least quickly try to identify a few units with which we can proceed. Can you give us a broad timeline, sir, by when we could expect that first list being finalized, or at least by when we could expect the guidelines, in a sense, to be finalized? No, no. At, at this stage, I will not speculate. Okay. All right. Let me then ask you as far as the overall budget is concerned. And we had this conversation uh, on the day of the economic survey, and it's, uh, it seems like it's panned out the way that we spoke. It is uh, a budget that's focused very clearly and squarely on the agriculture sector and its effort to try and revive rural, uh, the rural economy. Uh, do you believe that the finance minister has delivered on that front? Very well, so. Very well, so. Now, you know, th there is a broad side to it, which is that, you know, wh whereas the urban demand has actually kicked off reasonably well, rural demand has been tapping. Uh, so it also, the, the budget also tries to address that. Uh, but in addition, I think there are some very specific uh, measures the budget takes uh, towards uh, rural electrification, towards uh, rural roads, towards irrigation, towards building the supply chain from farm to uh, 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 the market. So large number of very specific uh, uh, measures uh, to revive the rural economy and then also to bring relief mm. to the poor. So there is health insurance for the BPL households and there is also for uh, the, the, the female members of the households who are doing most of the cooking uh, in households where biofuel is still used 
predominantly sure. uh, there is uh, the promise to bring LPG to them. Well, there's more exclusive fine print and analysis lined in ahead. But for that, let's go across to Shireen Vaughan, who is joined by the Revenue Secretary, Hashmuk Adir. Over to you, Shireen. Good feedback you have brought. Well, thanks very much. And this is live television, so you probably just saw somebody walk across your camera. But that's uh, that's far for the course. Uh, joining me here is the is the budget team, uh, the Revenue Secretary, Mr. Hashmuk Adir, and uh, Shakti Kantadas, the Economic Affairs Secretary. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. You've had uh, a very, very busy month and you've had a particularly busy day today, but congratulations on, on getting the budget done. Mr. Adhya and uh, Mr. Das, let me start by asking you, Mr. Das, when you were presenting your comments a uh, short while ago with the Finance Minister at the presser, you said that this has been a transformative budget. And Mr. Adhya, you said that this has been a realistic budget. Often we don't see the two coincide. So transformation and realism don't often go together because, uh, you know, either the expectations are very, very high, uh, on, especially on the tax fund that a budget it uh, holds out, and especially on the transformation part of it, it often falls short. Uh, let me start by asking you, Mr. Adia. No, uh, I said it's a realistic estimate of revenue. Mm -hmm. In terms of revenue estimate, it is a realistic estimate. That's all I said. Yes, that's exactly. But a uh, budget can be realistic as well as transformation. It's not very often that you see that happen. That's the, uh, the, the point that I was making. But let me ask you, Mr. Adia, and I want to start by talking to you about uh, the comment that you made in the, in the press conference where you said that there have been a lot of changes on the indirect tax fund, uh, which may or may not have been picked up because we are still going through the annexure at this point in time. I understand that a lot of what was already announced by uh, the, uh, the heavy industries ministry and the capital goods policy has now found its way into the budget. A lot of what was announced, for instance, by Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad as part of the electronic manufacturing policy has also found its way into the budget. Can you take us through the broad items uh, that you have put into the budget to try and protect domestic industry and also give a boost to domestic manufacturing? There are in fact quite a few. Each each one of the sector is covered in the indirect uh, taxation changes. So of course two very significant ones which you pointed out are capital goods industry wherein uh, we are taking uh, it from 7.5 percent, the BCD, basic custom duty on capital goods from 7.5 to 10 percent. On about 96 lines we are increasing the duty in capital goods. The other one of course very significant one is the electronic, hardware electronic uh, sector. Uh, last time we had a very successful experiment of uh, starting the mo mobile production, mobile phone production in India uh, because of the specific uh, duty structure which was created at that mm. time. Uh, going by the experience, we would like to extend it to some more items in the current year as per the phase manufacturing plan of the DIT. Department of Electronics has made a phase manufacturing plan. So we'll be taking some more items this year than some more items next year. So like that we would like to create an ecosystem for production of uh, electronic hardware industry in India. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Das, let me ask you about, uh, you know, what has been the sort of uh, rationale behind some of the decisions that have been taken as part of the budget. Uh, I'll come to you on the service tax and the expectation was that the service tax rate would have been high to 16%, but it hasn't. You've in place imposed a cess of the, the Krishi cess that's been imposed on all services. But, uh, but Mr. Das, uh, you know, given the fiscal challenges at this point in time and given the fact that you also need to stimulate domestic growth and domestic demand, do you believe that this has been a judicious mix of what you've tried to do as far as the budget is concerned? You see, this is a very balanced budget. And uh, also, if I can take the question which you had uh, posed a little while earlier, that is how you can sort of mix uh, a realistic budget with a budget which is transformative. When we say it's a realistic budget, there are two components to it. Number one, as my colleague has mentioned, the, uh, the tax projections and all the revenue projections are very, very realistic. Mm. And... Uh, in fact, if you see the tax growth projected this year is 11.7%, uh, that mm. is for 16-17. And it's a realistic budget for another reason that the budget addresses all the existing challenges which our economy faces today. The problem of rural distress, the problem which is faced in, by the agriculture sector, the problem of rural infrastructure, the problems in the social sector, and that takes me to the transformative aspect. There are certain structural reforms also which the budget has addressed. Take for example the, you know, the transport sector which mm. is the most unreformed sector as the finance minister has described. Now we are opening up that uh, sector through our legislation 
and it should be possible for average Indian citizen in the rural areas, in urban areas, uh, average middle class, lower middle class and ordinary citizen to get good road transport facilities, okay. bus facilities. So on the whole, the balance has been maintained between reforms and realism and with regard to the fiscal deficit target, it's a very, very realistic projection that has been made and it shall be achieved. But since we're talking about the fiscal deficit targets, and I know that a committee has been set up to review the FRBM Act itself and several questions were put to the Finance Minister and I asked the Minister of State for Finance as well on what now happens to the 3% number. 3.5% is sacrosanct. The government is committed to that. What happens now to the 3% number? How soon will this committee be set up? Will it have only government employees? Will it also have external members? Can you share some light on what we can expect yeah, on that? The committee will be set up very shortly. It will have external members, of course, because if it was to be done within the government, we could have done it ourselves. Government would like to have external inputs on that. And the rationale behind having a committee, and if you remember what the finance minister said in his budget speech, he prefaced it by saying that while remaining committed to the principle of fiscal prudence and fiscal consolidation. So therefore, fiscal prudence and fiscal consolidation continue to be important for the government. Yes. Now we have a challenge. Today we live in a very dynamic world where as, uh, you know, as everybody says, the uncertainty and volatilities have become the new norm. So, should government not have a policy space? Supposing you are in a good year, sure. the revenues are buoyant and you are doing well. Mm. Why 3%? We can afford to do even 2.7% and conserve that money to, you know, sort of uh, eliminate some of your past debts or keep that money for your future expenses. Mm. Or if the economy is in stress, why not the government have a, you know, a target of 3.1% or 3.2%. Mm. So that is why the range concept, this is one idea which has come. And in this background it was felt that let a committee look at it and give its expert opinion to the government. The government will look into the recommendations and take a decision. Yes, I understand that this was a part of the recommendations made by the committee of secretaries that submitted their recommendations to the Prime Minister on why have an absolute number, why not actually have a range that will take into consideration revenue collections and so on and so forth. No. Why decide? No? no, it was, I mean, let's not go into who recommended what. But to put things in perspective, it was a finance ministry uh, suggestion. We did get some suggestions from outside. Committee of Secretaries have given yes. several other recommendations also, but not this particular one. Okay. Mr. Adya, let me ask you about uh, what we're seeing happen as far as the retrospective uh, tax matter is concerned, because a one-time window has been given uh, to try and settle on those retrospective tax cases. I understand now that this is the same conciliation process that we've been attempting to do with the likes of Vodafone for a long, long time, sir. Uh, what, is, what is different from the already announced conciliation roadmap that was laid out by the CBDT? Well, there was no conciliation roadmap laid out. We were sort of uh, giving a signal that we would be willing to consider a proposal for conciliation. But one must realize, the FM also mentioned in the press conference, that as long as the law is there, the notice for taxation will stay. And the sovereign doesn't have any power to let go of any taxes on its own. So what we have done this time is that we are going to provide for it in the law itself. The finance bill, chapter number 10, contains specific scheme for dispute resolution in respect of retrospective cases. So if they are willing to settle uh, the case at that level, then now the law itself empowers the government to do so. But, uh, you know, talks have been on at least with one specific company and that is Vodafone. Uh, are, are they at all willing to, to take you up on your offer of, of paying the, the principal and as long as you waive the interest in the penalty? It, it's for, for them to decide, but the government has given a clear signal that this is how far we can go and that's it. Okay, let me bring in an external voice as well. Rajiv Mamani, country head of EY, also joins us. Mr. Mamani, do you believe that this window that the government has opened up by way of this, uh, uh, you know, retrospective uh, uh, chapter in the, in the finance bill, are we likely to be a resolution on the likes of the Vodafone kinds of cases? Let me, I'll just answer first. I must compliment uh, both the Revenue Secretary and the Finance Secretary. On, on a very, very good budget. So I think uh, my compliments to both of them. Uh, I, I, I doubt it uh, if, if they are likely to go in for something like this, but I think it also in many ways says that this is the, given the current circumstances, I think this is what, this is the best 
they could have done. They could have done. I think then they will leave the rest to the judicial process. I mean, that's the way I read it. But, but let me ask you this. And this is obviously a political call at the end of the day. But the government has the numbers. If you're willing to go this far, why not go the whole way and, and decide to repeal the retrospective uh, amendment altogether? Well, it's a question you must ask Finance Minister now. Was it discussed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, what has come out is this decision, you know, so you must uh, that? respect that. Usually various options uh, are always considered by the government. We have to also remember that this was a legislation which was passed by the parliament. And uh, so government has considered all possible options of dealing with this problem. In the first budget, the finance minister gave an assurance that the government will not henceforth undertake any retrospective legislation to create a fresh liability. That assurance was again repeated and reiterated in the last budget. This time, number of suggestions came and government, after considering all options, has taken this decision. Okay. Let me now also, Mr. Adi, ask you about the uh, voluntary disclosure scheme or the IDS. And you've said that this is different from the BDIS of 1997 uh, because uh, uh, that just required you to pay 35% or so on and so forth. And here you, you now need to pay about 45%. You haven't budgeted for this in, in the budget. Uh, take us to what the expectation really is as far as the IDS is concerned. Well, uh, I don't think anybody should have any expectation out, out of such schemes. When we declared the black money scheme also, we specifically refused to set any target for it. Because you cannot set a target for it. But the black money scheme, sir, to be fair, has been a non-starter of an idea. Well, whatever it is, the idea was that we will give an honest uh, opportunity to people who want to come clean. That was the idea behind the black money act. Here is another idea for the domestic black money. If people want to come forward and declare their black money, this is an opportunity, a window. And the finance minister has said, that this is the opportunity we are giving. After that, of course, we are free to go after them. And finance minister has specifically spoken on that. So it is a window given to them. We don't have any specific expectation. We are not using, uh, we have not uh, built in this uh, particular uh, income in the target of the current year. So if I can just yeah. supplement, uh, supplement what uh, the revenue secretary has said. You see, it is not a tax mobilization measure. Government is now coming you know, moving in a very systematic manner to deal with the problem of unaccounted money in the economy. Unaccounted money which has gone from here and kept abroad or unaccounted money which is within India. So government is moving in a very systematic manner. This is an opportunity to people to come clean. It's not a revenue mobilization measure. Okay. So naturally there cannot be a target. Sure. Uh, but, but, you know, I just had, uh, I've very quickly gone through the scheme. Uh, I think just uh, two requests. One is, you've said people who have, who, where the assessment proceedings are going under 143.2 or who have had such, or they will not be covered. To the extent that it doesn't relate to this income, maybe it's for a separate year or a separate matter, if you can cover it just widens the ambit. So someone may be having a 143.2 process going for something completely different, but if he wants to disclose on which the proceedings are not going, well, 143, if it is going on, he can also c cover himself under the new scheme of uh, dispute resolution. So that, that process also can be followed. No, I'm saying, sir, on the VDIS. But, yeah, VDIS, the income which is not uh, mm. part of the... No, but we would like uh, to uh, make it very sure yeah. that people who have had read at that place and mm. uh, people are being examined for whatever black money they have been caught off, those people will not be eligible under the scheme. Yeah, you know, we wanted to keep that distinction very clearly. Sir, here I understand. 143. It may not be this income which is yeah. caught. Right. Maybe some other income. Right. But we just want to keep him out. Okay. I hope that satisfies you, Mr. Bhamani. It doesn't look like it does, but, uh, but maybe you can take that conversation <laughs> offline. But I want to get both of you to comment on something else which the street was expecting. I'm happy it hasn't come through, which is the hike as far as the service tax is concerned. In place, you put it in another test, and this is the Krishi uh, test of about 0.5% across all services. Was the rationale not to hike the service tax because of the changes that haven't been made on the Senvat side, Mr. Ado? Well, the reason is that, you know, if you see the service tax composition among the top 10 items which are contributing service tax, mainly these are financial institutions, insurance companies, NBFCs, they pay 14% of service tax. People said that it was becoming really unbearable for them to have any more increase. That is number one. Number two, even when, when the GST comes, we will have a seamless flow of credit from uh, services to goods to whatever. At present, we don't have that seamless flow of credit even between excise and service tax. 
So without giving the benefit of uh, seamless sandbag credit, we cannot increase it up to the level of GST. Okay. So that's the reason why we were conservative in uh, increasing it. Yeah, Mr. Mani. Sir, I just sorry, just asking. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the reactions we saw when this when this was being discussed, is that people, you know, you could have increased the levy from 14 to, you know, 14.5 percent. The problem with this, from a ease of doing business, is that one more computation. Uh, you know, for manufacturing companies, this will not be creditable uh, because it will only be unless it will only be creditable against companies which are paying service tax and who are who this tax has been levied. So I think just like the Swachh Bharat says, you, you know, this will be another computation. That will be another computation on service tax. Another computation. So the only request is just to keep it simple. Even if the raise is 0.5 percent. I'm not commenting on the revenue mobilization measure, but it just makes it easier to collect it that no, way. True, that's a well, very well made point. But the Basis, basis. We are presuming that the present uh, oil price uh, uh, regime will uh, continue for some more time, and this is the basis of our assumption. Okay. So we are not assuming any increase or decrease in any our increase? revenue projections. Okay. Mr. Mavani, final comment. No, I just have uh, uh, one uh, uh, question. I think they, I mean, it was a, everyone was hoping, and there was a lot of conjecture that this long-term capital gains tax will go to you know uh, three years. But I think the pleasant surprise was that. <laughs> it was I, I also meant to add one. I know that. I, of finance said. He said it's a rumor. It was never, never on the so table. Never, I, never I, a consideration. I, I just, I just, I just want to say that. I, in fact, so uh, I think it's a very last minute thing. Yeah. My, my, my understanding is the last minute because I can't see the provision in the bill, in the act, in the memorandum, and also in the amendment in the act, section 242, which requires amendment. It's not there. No, we are not going to do it. This year, long term capital. No, no, no. So the two years. For uh, listed security, we are not. No, changing. sir. From three to two. For, uh, for unlisted. For unlisted. For unlisted, it was uh, actually left out because of too many uh, amendments in the bill. Right. So we'll bring an official amendment. You're saying that. We have announced it. So you're we'll saying we. You're saying that. That's right. We didn't get it wrong. It was not uh, not just no, a rumor. It was being discussed and debated. That part was separate. Unlisted security, we were to do it from three to two in any case. Yeah. But for the long term. Listed security. Again, for the listed security, the question is that we thought about. It, the best time to do it would be to when GAR comes into being and then Mauritius route is plugged. Then there will not be a competitive disadvantage of domestic investor versus the Mauritius route investor. So it, 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 it hasn't died yet. No, it hasn't died. No, I'm just yeah. saying that the private one is not is, is not there in the it's not there in the amendment. Okay, Mr. Das. No, I just want to say that uh, this speculation has been going on for the last several weeks in the yeah. market. 
and I think uh, some sections of the media also went to the extent of uh, saying that he and I were having a big fight. <laughs> but let me tell you, Why? there is no Why such you? fight. We were on, we were working together, <laughs> and you see, in a budget making process. That doesn't mean you can't disagree, sir. You can work together, but you could have disagreements. There can be disagreements of opinion, and number of issues there is, you know. So was there a disagreement of opinion no, on coming this? Coming to this particular point, you see, when you prepare a budget, you get lots of suggestions. Now, which suggestion gets accepted fully, partly, which suggestion gets rejected? Why go into all that? Let's Could be revisited when uh, when GAR comes into effect, as the Revenue Secretary said. Unfortunately, we would have loved to continue with this conversation, but we've run out of time. Mr. Adya, Mr. Das, Mr. Romani, always a pleasure having you here on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate you joining us here. Let's go across now to the Power Minister, who's... Uh, uh, who's joining us live here on CNBC TV 18, Mr. Puyesh Goyal. Mr. Goyal, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18, sir, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, let me ask you, sir, uh, as far as the rural electrification plan is concerned, the government has allocated 8,500 crore rupees for the Gram Jyoti Yojana, sir, but they've also advanced the rural electrification milestone to 2,000, 100% rural electrification now being advanced to 2018 May, if I'm correct. Well, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister had announced on 15th August 2015 that we will make sure within a thousand days that every village in the electricity gets connected and power reaches there. We are committed to that. The Finance Minister has been generous with his budgetary allocation and I assure the nation through you that before, well before the target, possibly by end of 2017 itself, we will ensure that these 18,452 villages, and by the way, Shireen, these are the worst villages. They are the top of mountains, they are in dense forests. We will make sure that electricity reaches there by end of 2017. The updated figure today of completed village is 5,899. By March, we should cross 7,000. So we have already done one third of the villages. We are committed to doing this. And by 19, 2019, we'll also make sure every home gets electricity 24 by 7. So you're saying that you will actually better on uh, what the budget has articulated, Mr. Goyal? In terms of rural electrification rollout? Yes, certainly. We'll do, we'll do it much faster. We are very confident. We have a well-rolled-out program. It is available on an app which I have urged you and your readers to download.